We've got a special guest today, Lei Nognun. We're going to be talking about quite a few things, nutrition, mindset, training, and even metabolic adaptation, hormones, things like that. I've got a couple of questions lined up for him. I'm very excited about this one because there are really good questions that we will be asking Lane. Um, all right, you're going to have to forgive me. I just got up and I was chasing my cat all morning and I, my hair is not good. <laughs> So, oh good. <laughs> a line of question for you that you will be excited to talk about. <laughs> I want to make sure I've got plenty of time to talk to you about some of the questions. So, let's get them from the very beginning. Um, what is the longest a person can spend without training before they start losing muscle, in your opinion? So there's two answers to this. The first answer is if we look at the research studies, um, typically you don't really start to see like a, a, a measurable amount of lean mass loss uh, until about two weeks. Um, that's where you can start to see like some reductions in lean mass. Um, but, you know, I doubt it's, you know, <laughs> I doubt it is a situation where it's like, Nothing happens, nothing happens, and at the end of two weeks, you just start losing lean mass. I don't think that's it. Um, I think what it is is our instruments to measure lean mass are not sensitive enough to p pick up differences until you've lost a certain amount of lean mass. And so um, I would say it probably starts from, you know, a couple days after you cease lifting a body, a, you know, specific body part. Um, you know, you've always got your rates of muscle protein synthesis and your rates of protein degradation running simultaneously. And in order to be in an anabolic state, your rate of synthesis has to exceed your rate of degradation. And so um, whenever that starts to cross the threshold of degradation exceeding synthesis, then you're going to start to have slow progressive loss of muscle protein. And that probably occurs, you know, four or five days after you finish uh, training a body part. So, um, but I mean, we're talking about like, you know, you might lose a few grams of muscle or something like that. We're not talking about anything, uh, anything uh, crazy. I ask this question because obviously I work in a hospital as well and I do see a lot of patients that don't get to do any sort of exercise for a long time or they may have been doing a really good job at getting some work, work done, especially when we're thinking about people who are at high risk of losing mm -hmm. lean body mass, uh, let's say people over 65 years old, but also people that is, are they lifting, they're doing a lot of really good workouts uh, consistently, and suddenly they get sick or they have to stop training for over a period of one, two weeks time. And there's the concern of, oh, am I, am I gonna lose in, gonna lose all the, the gains that I have made so far? Mm -hmm. But can you mitigate some of these by maybe doing something with your nutrition, eating more protein, or is there anything that you will be able to help to reduce that risk? So I think the first thing to say is if you lose muscle over a two-week period, you will gain it back incredibly fast, probably within the first workout or two. Like it's not, you know, I think people have this idea, I don't know, people like look at metabolism way too much as on and off switches. You know, mm -hmm. and so, um, like when I say lose muscle, it's not that much. You know, like now if you take six weeks or six months off of lifting, yeah, then you're going to see quite a bit of lean mass loss. Um, but you know, just a few weeks, I really, you don't really need to do any special tricks or anything like that. Like you're not going to lose that much and it's going to come back like that. Um, you know, if you're already eating enough protein, Increasing it further is not going to do anything. I mean, the one thing you can do is, you know, something is better than nothing. So even if you're just like, I don't know, I'm just trying to think about a scenario where you stop lifting for a few weeks but still have the desire to do so. Um, even just like walking and being active or, I don't know, picking up some milk jugs or something, you know, like any doing some push-ups, doing some pistol squats, like anything is better than nothing. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things that can be done and, um, like if none of those are an option, like 
um, <clears throat> you know, oh, pardon me. <clears throat> Somebody asked. My voice was lower. I've <laughs> I've got a little bit of a. Um, I don't think I'm sick, but my I think it's the pollen around here. Um, so there. It has been shown that intermittent uh, blood flow restriction, applying cuffs to your limbs here and here intermittently, could actually reduce the risk of muscle loss during bed rest. So if somebody is bedridden, that is a, a possible um, tool in the toolbox. And then actually I was so impressed, so my mother is currently going through uh, cancer treatment. I've never really talked about this much online, um, but my, my mom doesn't mind it, so I don't mind talking about it. My mom was diagnosed with multiple myeloma nine years ago. And uh, which is an incurable form of basically a bone marrow cancer. Um, and she's done great, like she's, she's still kicking ass. She recently started coming out of her mission and is actually getting treatment here at a facility called Moffitt Cancer Center, which is one of the best uh, cancer centers in the United States. And um, so as part of her treatment, they have her walking at least a mile every day after her, even though she's getting cancer treatment because um, you know, that's so important for preventing loss of muscle mass. And we know that actually one of the main killers of cancer patients is actually cancer cachexia, the slow <laughs> progressive loss of muscle mass. And so, um, you know, getting people, it used to be thought about that, um, you know, well, cancer patients, when they're getting treatment, we want to keep them on bed rest. We got to rest them, you know, all that kind of stuff. And now it's not, no, no, go exercise. Like, if you're nauseous and, like, feel like shit, of course, no. But, like, if you can do it, do it. Um, because if you don't use it, you will lose it. And uh, so everybody commenting, thank you so much. Uh, don't worry, my mom is a bad motherfucker. Uh, she's, uh, when she got diagnosed, I remember thinking, oh, cancer doesn't pick the wrong woman to fuck with. I can tell you that right now. So... <laughs> Um, I am not at all worried. I know she's going to kick its ass again, and um, you know I I expect her to die with this, not because of this. So, uh, thank you all for your thoughts. I appreciate that. I really hope that your mom gets out of this one. I know that she will. Now, I'm talking about cancer cachexia and like cancer treatments and how people get get malnourished out of it. So do you do you believe like in my experience when I have worked with patients like this, one of the biggest risks for malnutrition is their symptoms, like all the symptoms post uh, chemotherapy, the nauseous, the the amount of fatigue, the amount of not being able to eat because they can't keep keep it keep it down. So do you believe that, that even trying to do few little things with the movement, even if it's as much as they can tolerate, that will help them reduce that risk of lean body mass loss? Yeah, absolutely. Um, because at the end of the day, if you're at least doing something, it's going to try and pull those reserves from adipose rather than lean mass. Um, and this is actually, this is a great segue into why the messaging around nutrition and cancer is so damaging. The messaging of, oh, you should fast oh, you should do keto. Um, I, th these are pe people who have never actually worked with fucking patients. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Like, go tell a cancer patient who's throwing up multiple times and the only thing they can keep down is ice cream and Gatorade. Oh, you shouldn't have sugar. Well, guess what? That's what they can keep down and them retaining some lean mass and getting some food in is way more important so they can recover is way more important than them limiting their sugar. And I am consistently, sorry, Esther, I'm going to go on a little rant. I am consistently disgusted by the people on um, social media who shame cancer patients. I saw a, a picture of a gal who was, taking a bite, who was taking a lick of ice cream after a cancer treatment and she had a wristband on. And people were in the comments telling her that she gave herself cancer because she ate sugar and she shouldn't be eating that. Like, I'm sorry, fuck right off. All of you are human pieces of garbage. Um, you don't know what you're talking about. And again, being able to retain more lean mass is so much more important for cancer mortality mm -hmm. than worrying about some sugar. And this is the whole, well, 
cancer can't run if it doesn't have sugar. No, that has been debunked years ago. Um, they have shown that cancer is very, very plastic with what it can take. Um, it can use amino acids for fuel. It can use fatty acids for fuel in many cases. And it can use ketones in some cases. So all of you idiots out there ranting about how you should not have sugar or you should fast if you have cancer, please shut up and leave it to people who are actual professionals. Thank you, about. <laughs> Yeah, I, it, it's, it's important to say that because I am sick of seeing that as well. And patients in the real life, in hospital, that I'm seeing them every single day, they need to eat. And the biggest thing is they don't get, they don't have appetite. They are throwing up all the time because they can't keep things down. They have diarrhea. They have like lots of different digestive symptoms. And the main thing is high protein, high energy diet. And eating as much as you possibly can keep down and tolerate. It doesn't matter what it is. As long as you can put some food in and fuel your body, that gives you some, a little bit of some energy to do the little things that you can do once you're feeling a little bit better. And hey, listen, if, you, if you're a cancer patient and you want to do a ketogenic diet and you can get enough calories in that way, you get enough protein in that way, and you want to eat that way, got absolutely no problem with that. I don't think there's a real downside to it. But... I just, again, like, after talking to actual cancer patients um, about the level of nausea that they had, you realize pretty quickly that it's just not a tenable solution for most of them. And we need to sit in the real world where cancer cachexia is one of the biggest killers of cancer patients. People don't realize Cancer treatment, it, they're, they're getting much more advanced, but for a long time, and I'm not talking chemotherapy. Chemotherapy has saved millions of people's lives. It saved my mother's life. My mom is alive today because of Big Pharma. So when people go on about Big Pharma, <laughs> um, but chemotherapy is basically you are poisoning your body and you are trying to poison it enough to where you poison the cancer cells without overdoing it on your healthy cells. And um, one of the side effects of that is drastic muscle loss, and that can actually kill you. So trying to keep it enough to keep yourself recovered so that you can tolerate the treatment is so important. Let's move on to the second question about nutrition. And that this one is was very interesting because this is how do you make a nice transition from macro tracking without feeling like you will lose all your progress once you don't track anymore like what would be your three major priorities when it comes to losing weight without tracking or even just not not tracking and not losing weight but maintaining once you no longer can track or decide not to track anymore yeah quick i just saw a question from john that said are the benefits of marijuana with cancer uh with helping with increased appetite uh, actually, that was one of the only things uh, that helped my mother was uh, was weed. To be honest, um, it uh, it uh, helped with her nausea and her appetite. So for some people, that can help. Um, so yeah, my mom, who never used it her entire life, was uh, was getting brownies with, with, with was getting weed brownies during her cancer treatment. Um, uh, HMB for cancer patients, actually HMB is a scam for most people, but for cancer it may actually have usefulness. Okay, on to your question, Astrid. So, so you're kind of talking about transitioning to more of an intuitive eating style? Okay. No, so, not necessarily intuitive eating, but more so like not tracking anymore. More informed eating, if you wanted to talk about more of a neutral term. Okay. So I think one of the things that tracking does is it does make you um, aware of portion sizes. Um, if you've never weighed and tracked your food, I can almost promise you, unless you don't eat any processed food whatsoever, um, you probably have a really poor understanding of serving sizes. Um, and so weighing and tracking for a while can be really useful for that. Um, what I would say is if you want to move into not tracking, Probably the way to do that, if I was going to do it, 
I would basically, one, be pretty consistent with what I eat day to day. Just, it makes it easier. Pardon me. And um, I would also be prioritizing protein at every meal. So I would be making sure I get a good serving of protein first. And then I would probably also be prioritizing my fruit and vegetable intake. And then if I still felt hungry after those things, then I would probably allow myself to have more of a treat or starches or, or those sorts of things. Not allow, but I would have it. Um, because when you're prioritizing the things that are more satiating and you feel full, you're less likely to overconsume things. But if you start out and you're – the other thing I would do is I would absolutely – I would – I would say absolutely not. But I would really try to limit snacking. Um, snacking, I don't – that is a big one. Not that snacking itself has some kind of like metabolic effect, but people just don't remember their snacks. They don't. Um, and in research uh, meta-analyses and systematic reviews of people who successfully lose weight and keep it off, one of the biggest characteristics that pops up is they don't snack. They eat their defined meals and, and that's it. They don't really snack. Because snacks are much, for whatever reason, when you're just kind of grazing, you don't, your appetite regulation is not as good as when you're eating defined meals. So those would kind of be the, the tools I would use to try and like switch over. Uh, establishing a structure, three meals to snacks or only three meals or the, whatever the amount of meals that you're going to be consistent with, that you're going to be following on a regular basis, relatively within a similar time frame yeah. uh, protein and vegetables obviously fiber are going to be very big contributors and being able to be present and intentional about your choices as well like knowing what you're putting in your body and going slow and not having so many distractions can help you to be mindful of what you're eating so that I think it is really good yeah that's another thing is um a lot of people eat when they're just like doing other stuff and like not paying attention. And there actually is research data to show that if you like focus on what you're eating, that it actually uh, improves your satiety regulation. I do think that mindful eating, the actual term is a little bit overrated because like when you do look at what mindful eating, the, the mindful eating exercise is, is like you have to spend time like setting your environment and making sure you're breathing slowly and you eat slowly and that you set up everything perfectly, that is probably unrealistic to do that every single meal. Um, so I guess it is more being intentional and mindful of your choices. And again, it's just allowing yourself to slow down and pay attention. Yeah. No, that, that's it. And just kind of... Uh any time that you are just being mindful of what you eat, it's going to improve your appetite regulation, uh, mostly just by drawing your own attention to it. I do have a lot of clients and people that ask me about menopause, perimenopause, and the challenges with body composition. So what is the missing link here? Why is this such a, a big topic where there's so many pro people arguing against the blaming hormones and blaming menopause and other people saying, hey, it's not your hormones, it's your attitude and how you respond to the things that are happening. So what is the missing link here? Oh, Astrid, you're going to get me in trouble again. Um, <laughs> yeah, I did a post, Jackie and I did a post about this a while back. And we got a lot of really angry women. Um, so I think this is an issue of me saying something and people hearing something else. So mm -hmm. what I said was that if you look at the hormonal changes during menopause, none of those hormones affect, uh, affect basal metabolic rate. That is a fact. They do not. Your, your estrogen levels, your progesterone, there's no real evidence that those affect your basal metabolic rate. Now, it is probably true that menopause makes weight loss more different more difficult so why if it's not affecting metabolic rate because everybody everybody always wants to be metabolic rate it's my metabolism my metabolism um for a few reasons it's because
becomes more difficult. Appetite regulation may be worse. Um, <laughs> people, if they are, um, as they're going through those hormonal changes, they feel worse, they get worse sleep, they, um, they don't feel as good, they spontaneously move less, and I have to be very clear about this, because people get offended all the time. No, no, I still do my two-hour workouts or my hour workout or whatever. I'm not talking about your workout. I'm talking about spontaneous, unconscious, physical activity, which is different than exercise and not something that you can modify. So that part is not your fault. If you are spontaneously moving less because you feel worse, that is not your fault. I'm not saying it's your fault, but it doesn't change the fact that you are moving less without realizing it. <clears throat> and, um, and so what is the solution to those things? Well, the solution to those things is to put even more emphasis on your lifestyle and diet, which is to be more regulated with your nutritional intake because um, a lot of menopausal women also turn to alcohol as a way to help them feel better. And guess what? Alcohol negatively impacts sleep, recovery, and it's very calorie dense. So, is it your metabolism? No, it is not your metabolism. But if you limit your alcohol, if you get better sleep, if you track your nutrition, then that is going to help you prevent that weight gain during menopause. And the reality is, if you subconsciously move less, it means to make up for that, you're going to have to consciously move more, okay? It's not fair. It's not your fault, but it is what helps. So people take what I say and they're saying, Lane is blaming victims and blah, blah, blah. No, I'm just living in reality. And if you want to live in Delulu land and pretend that your metabolism is broken, then go right ahead, but it's not going to help you improve. People with hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, or even thinking about PCOS, do they have actual harder time losing weight because of BMR being reduced somehow? So when we talk about hormones, thyroid is the one hormone that will uh, alter your metabolic rate. So people with hypothyroidism have been shown to have up to a 25% reduction in BMR. So that means like, for example, my BMR is about 2000 calories a day. So if I was hypothyroid, it could be down to like 1500. The important point to make here is a calorie deficit still works, okay? Because people go, well, I have thyroid issues. A calorie deficit doesn't work for me. No, it just means your threshold for what creates a calorie deficit is lower than what you would predict, okay? So um, thyroid absolutely can impact BMR. PCOS, there is one study that showed that it decreased BMR but then there's about 10 studies showing it doesn't. So the overall consensus of the data in the meta-analyses of it is that PCOS does not negatively impact your metabolic rate and um, it appears to uh, basically work. Here's the problem. We don't really know if women with PCOS have worse insulin sensitivity because they have PCOS or they have PCOS because they have a worse lifestyle and insulin sensitivity. Like they're there does appear to be like some kind of chicken or the egg type scenario here. Um, and possibly that it's kind of a vicious cycle where you may have PCOS that can create issues with insulin sensitivity and that can cause your PCOS symptoms to actually be worse. So there is some crosstalk here, but what I would say is, um, you know, again, the things that work are lifestyle adjustments, right? Like if you have, if you have low thyroid, Go to endocrinologist, get that treated, done deal. Um, if you're PCOS, your best bet is typically going to be lifestyle interventions. A regular stress management, you respect your sleep, you eat protein, you train, and you do everything that you need to do in order to make your lifestyle accordingly healthier in all ways possible. So what Astra just listed is 90% of living a healthy life most of you will miss it and won't do it because you're too busy looking for hacks and easy shit um, because you, you like the idea of a three-minute cold plunge more than doing the consistent work, which is lift, be consistent with your nutrition, get enough sleep, 
don't overdo alcohol, and stress management. That is massive. If you did all the things that Astrid just talked about, not only would you be healthier and your sleep would be better, um, you would actually have a lower risk of injury as well. So the research, people think stretching prevents injuries. It doesn't. There's no evidence that stretching actually prevents injuries. You know what does prevent injuries? Uh, three sleep. big things. Sleep. So sleep reduces, if you're getting eight hours versus four, so it reduces your injury risk by double. So it reduces your injury risk by over 200%. If you do psychological stress management, that drastically reduces your risk of injury. In fact, one of the most effective treatments for chronic pain is cognitive behavioral therapy. People don't realize this because they think this shit is separate from your body. And it is not. These two things cross talk, okay? Your body affects your brain and your brain affects your body. And the last thing is believing that you are resilient. Believe it or not, actually people who believe that they are resilient have lower pain and have less injuries and recover faster from injuries. But most of you guys, you don't want to hear about this kind of stuff because cognitive behavioral therapy, ah, oh, shit, that takes work. Mm, cold plunge. Uh, tracking macros and being consistent. Nah, I don't like that. Give me a supplement. Um, lifting consistently. Uh, I don't know, can't I just do some 15 minute routine? Like, the stuff that works is the stuff that most people just don't want to do. In the same line of thoughts, um, we, we talk about IBS and how a lot of people suffer from GI distress and a lot of inflammation and things like that. And it gets back to the same principles that may affect the same issues. You probably don't have an actual IBS flare because of food. You're blaming certain foods as cutting them out. It's actually a lot of stress, poor sleep management, or you're very going through a very difficult time and that is affecting your emotional state and that emotional state is affecting how you process everything. But it has nothing to do with food. And we sometimes tend to blame something that has nothing to do with the problem. People do miss psychological stress so much mm -hmm. and if they understood the impact that your psychological stress has on your physical body they would put so much more effort into understanding stress management techniques I wish I had done it when I was younger the correlation between psychological disorders or psychiatric disorders and IBS is extremely strong People who have IBS are much more likely to have psychiatric disorders and vice versa. Much more likely to have high levels of um, anxiety. And they have shown that in fact, many autoimmune disorders, very high association with psychological stress and lack yeah. of psychological stress management. Um, so like this, this stuff, I mean, certain foods can flare up IBS, yeah. but if you look down the etiology of a lot of people who have inflammatory disorders or autoimmune disorders, whenever I've spoken to these folks, almost at the root cause is a person who is very anxious, um, endures a lot of psychological stress, a lot of overthinking, ruminating, and actually getting back to pain what you do when you ruminate is you actually make pain worse. There are, there are very clear studies to show this. When you're thinking about the pain all the time, what you do is create a stronger connection and you basically strengthen that pain response. So you, you, this is not something that is easy to fix is the problem. And so people, and I'm, I'm not dogging on drugs. You already established I'm a big show for pharma, right? Um, but People go, well, give me a, a drug to fix this pain thing. Give me, I don't know, ketamine. Give me um, uh, mushrooms. Give me this. Give me that. Instead of actually what you're doing, so my friend John Deloney, who's a fantastic follower. If you guys don't follow him, you should be following him. John Deloney wrote a book on anxiety that was the best book I've ever read about anxiety. And what he said about anxiety is people think anxiety is the problem. Anxiety is your smoke alarm. Anxiety mm -hmm. is 
is you're telling you is something in your body telling you we are not safe and instead of trying to figure out where the smoke is coming from people go and tear the batteries out of the smoke alarm or they try to turn the smoke alarm off instead of figuring out hey what is actually causing the smoke alarm to go off because your body is doing exactly what it's supposed to the problem is you are trying to treat the symptom and you aren't treating the root cause so uh, the book is called uh, Building a Non-Anxious Life. I highly recommend checking it out. But one of the things he talks about is if you look at people with high anxiety, a lot of times they're in bad relationships or they don't have close friends or they don't spend a lot of time with friends or they're in debt. Or and he's like, we keep trying to fix the, the symptom instead of fixing the root cause of why you're anxious in the first place. I agree. It, it has so much to do with anxiety and even trauma that we, we yes. don't really think about that. And sometimes it's something that we even haven't realized that we have until you start digging deeper into why you are the way you are responding to certain things. And then suddenly, oh, well, actually, one of the diagnoses that your psychologist tells you is, well, you probably have some trauma from the past. From when you were a child or something uh, this is so common to see and we don't know until we know yeah is, is what yeah, i mean i i i i am pretty extreme in terms of being an advocate for therapy of cognitive behavioral therapy because i realized until i went to therapy i didn't even know myself i didn't know why certain things made me mad why i like saying a certain way i i didn't know and one of the things that i was horrible at that I, like, I've, I've seen myself get better at was self-soothing. If I was upset, I had to text 20 friends or people I knew just to like get a response and validation and feel better. And one of the big you know, um, improvements I've seen in myself is <sighs> slowing down, taking some deep breaths. It seems dumb. Going out for a walk. I can promise you, whatever your problem is, if you go outside and walk, it will not be worse than when you left. In most cases, it's better. These are evidence-based ways to lower stress and anxiety. Deep breaths, walking, getting out in the sunlight, exercise. These are the things that matter. Okay, now I'm not, again, I'm not against medication if people need some extra help or whatever, but... This is the shit that works. And also, again, you know, if, if somebody's in a uh, toxic relationship and they're having anxiety all the time, it doesn't matter how many drugs you take or what you do, until you get that out of your life, you're going to have anxiety. Uh, <laughs> the name of the book is Building a Non-Anxious Life by John Deloney. Um, if you're in... $200,000 of debt, you're going to have anxiety. Like, that is your body doing exactly what it is supposed to do. Your body is not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. You don't have an anxiety disorder. You're freaking out because you should be freaking out. Like, <laughs> this is your body trying to bang on the door and get your attention, right? So, um, yeah, I just, I'm a big fan of trying to address the root cause of things. And again, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not. Um, I'm not a therapist or anything like that. But I've just seen enough scientific data that psychological stress is like. I believe in time will go down as the biggest killer of mankind that there is in terms of reducing lifespan. Um, and I will tell you one more thing that I tell people all the time. Because people, I guess some people worry about, well, uh, what about this type of carbohydrate and this oil that I cook with? And uh, what about my feeding window? And uh, the amount of stress that you're incurring by worrying about all these minute details is killing you faster than if you get the details wrong. To the basics first, and then you mayor in, in the minors and minor in the mayors. Yeah, like yeah. That. so they call, we call it <laughs> stepping over dollars to pick up pennies. I mean, I, I've just seen so many people get so freaked out about the smallest details, and I'm just sitting there thinking, 
you're actually taking minutes off your life right now. Like, by worrying about shit that really doesn't matter, you know? And, um, yeah, it's just sometimes I just want to take people and be like, wake up! Do you believe that, that the I would, that I, would, I would never really physically assault somebody, like, you know. Like, in your mind? In my mind, yeah. Do you believe that then antidepressants make people more depressed? Or they no. have some, some place? No, I mean, if you look at the research data on, like, SSRIs, um, it shows that, in general, they have a positive effect on reducing depression. Now, I, I have... I've heard from some people who have taken antidepressants that, you know, they didn't like them, um, they made them feel numb, or that they had side effects like low libido, you know, like those sorts of things. So, <coughs> so, sorry. so I think, um, you know, a very individual, you know, if somebody gets a benefit from an SSRI and it helps them, then I'm all for that. Like, I, I think that, you know, we shouldn't be taking tools out of people's toolkits, but... Again, you know, if you're having undesirable side effects, okay, let me put it this way. I'm a fan of people getting uh, pharmaceutical help to help jumpstart them while they also get lifestyle and behavior mm -hmm. change. Yeah. Because if you're just doing pharmaceutical, I mean, it will work, but it's not going to work as good. In fact, if you look at the, the effect sizes on exercise versus SSRIs, exercise actually has a as much or bigger effect on depression than SSRIs. So now the problem is people who are depressed, you know, the last thing they want to do is get up and go exercise. But, you know, this is one of those things where like, hey, sometimes you got to do it when you don't feel like doing it because, you know, it's, uh, it's better for you. Okay, I want to address this. SSRIs are linked to mass shootings. Yeah, that that would that would falls under the no shit category. You so you're telling me people with psychological disorders might be more likely to take SSRIs and also might be more likely to have do mass shootings? Oh, file that under the no fucking shit category. Sorry, I just All don't right. like it when people um, <laughs> you know, this is what we call confounding intermediary variables, okay? We just mm -hmm. need to keep that in mind. I don't see I, I just I'm not for demonizing um, category, entire categories of drugs um, based off weak epidemiological evidence. So, any Just a closer relationship to depression and maybe just going into the, into the same topic. How do you feel about your what you eat and your gut microbiome? I know this is a very broad topic and there's a lot of things that still need to be in, looked and um, researched, but so far, what, what we know about nutrition and how what we eat, the, the amount of fiber we eat, the quality of our nutrition impacts what is in our, in our gut microbiome and microbiota, how does that affect our psychological health in some way? Depression, emotional state, mood? Yeah, so this is difficult to disentangle because if you look at what encompasses like an overall healthy diet, which is like control calories, adequate protein, um, you know, high fiber, I mean, you see most those things improve. You see the gut microbiome improve, and you see uh, depression improve. So some people have postulated that it could be you know, a link between the gut and the mind. We, we do know that there is communication between the gut and the mind um, or the brain. We don't. Well, what I would stop short of saying is that you know by modifying our gut microbiome, we can fix depression or, or something like that, right? Like, but it's so hard to disentangle this stuff because an overall healthy lifestyle is going to help all those things so um in line with that you know the best thing you can do for your gut is eating well one exercise they've shown that actually lactate production appears to have some beneficial effects on the gut microbiome to um eat enough fiber from diverse yep. arrays of fruits and vegetables um, like and getting diverse grains. yeah grains whole grains God, that got me in trouble on Huberman. I said whole grains, and then I said cereals, because cereals fall into the whole grains category. <laughs> and it was like, how much is General Mills paying you? And I'm like, shit, I wish General Mills was paying me. God, I'd, I'd be able to keep my house. It'd be great. Um, so, you know, the fact is that fibrous sources of you know, prebiotic fibers are the main fuels for the gut, 
And when it, when, even when you come down to looking at probiotics versus prebiotics, because prebiotics are, are prebiotic fibers, like I said, it's not close. Prebiotic fibers have a much more beneficial effect on the gut than probiotics. So, again, I'm a big fan of just an overall healthy lifestyle. I think people get way too caught up in the mechanisms. And this was me, you know, circa 15 years ago as a young biochemistry graduate. Um, you know, I thought mechanisms were everything. Actually, shit, 20 years ago. Fuck, I graduated the college 20 years ago. Ah. Um, uh, bio, as a biochemist, I was all about mechanisms. And now as I've gotten older and had a really great PhD advisor, I've learned to step back and realize that, you know, focusing on the blades of grass is probably not as important as looking at the overall forest. And when you, when you focus on individual biochemical pathways, what you're doing is you're focusing on blades of grass. Yes, blades of grass yes. pick up the forest, but there's a lot more that goes into a forest than just blades of grass. And um, so what I tell people is like, hey, like, sure, maybe, you know, the, maybe the gut, you know, has this crosstalk with the brain and this, but we don't really need to know that. What we know is that if you eat an overall healthy diet, your brain is healthier, your heart is healthier, your microbiome is healthier, your insulin sensitivity is better, like, who cares what the what the actual mechanism is? We already know. We know. We know what produces this. It's like it's like people need this special knowledge in order to go execute stuff. And it's like no, just go do the thing. And we hear all the time these like heavy metals, parasites, um, bacteria, and everything that can be bad for like affect our overall healthy state. Mm -hmm. How how much of these heavy metals can actually be impact. I mean, for the most, for the most part, um, heavy metals are not really that present in the food supply. I mean, you'd have to eat, like, you're like, oh my god, I, I know it's not the same thing, like arsenic and rice. It's like, do you realize how much rice you'd have to eat to get a level of arsenic that would harm you? Like, it's, it is so much. Um, this is usually, the parasites and heavy metals thing is usually a trope from naturopaths who are trying to sell you supplements and treatments that you don't need for problems that you don't have. Um, do parasites exist? Yes. Do some people get parasites? Yes. Is it the cause of a, even a moderate amount of problems? No. We, we, the food supply has only gotten more cleanly over time the health crisis and obesity crisis we're in, and oh, by the way, parasites tend to have the opposite effect. Parasites actually make you lose weight. But the health crisis we're in didn't spontaneously start 60 years ago because all of a sudden just a bunch of parasites got in our food and heavy metals. That's, that's not what happened. Absolutely. I totally agree. Now, one last question, I, and I let you go because I, I know you've, you've got a very busy day coming. And I got to um, here because it's, it's bothering me <laughs> uh, okay so we were talking about fibers and i have this but i have heard in several occasions about type of different types of fiber and how this can affect energy balance because some of them can be absorbed and digested partially and some of them can't and this comes to this Controversial topic of net carbs, total carbs, and what actually gets absorbed, how much calories has a gram of fiber, and whether you should track it or not. You have two basic different types of fiber. You have insoluble fiber and you have soluble fiber. They're also referred to as non-fermentable and fermentable. Um, hang on real quick, I want to I answer this question. But if you say you need a lot of X to harm you about many things, wouldn't all that add up? Your body has things called uh, exc excretory pathways to get rid of those things. If it didn't, we would all die by age five, okay? We can get rid of bad shit in our bodies, thankfully. Even things like heavy metals, there's ways to get them eliminated. It's just that some of those processes, if you get a lot of heavy metal, uh, like a huge dose, you can't eliminate it fast enough to offset the toxicity. But we have ways to get rid of them. Okay, now... You have, fiber. Soluble, you have soluble, also <laughs> called fermentable fiber, uh, and it's just what it sounds like. So soluble means it will dissolve in water, and it can be fermented. 
And then you have non-fermentable or insoluble fiber, which is just what it sounds like. It can't be dissolved in water, and it cannot be fermented. Although, there are some recent road studies suggesting that possibly hemicellulose may be able to be fermented, but that's, that's in rats, so we got to wait till there's more data on that. Um, <clears throat> so basically, your insoluble fiber is... Um, the type of fibers around it make it inaccessible for digestive enzymes, and it basically adds bulk to your stool and allows you to uh, poop more regularly. And that may actually have a benefit for um, colon cancer because there's evidence that the more quickly you can move fecal matter through the large intestine, the lower the risk of colon cancer because the toxins in poop have less time to interact with uh, the inside of your colon, essentially. Okay, so there's that. Now, those are considered, you know, basically zero calories because you don't, your, your digestive enzymes can't assess them. Now, soluble fiber becomes a little bit of a different story. It depends on the specific type of soluble fiber. Uh, soluble fiber can be anywhere from, like, basically zero calories to four calories. So it can be full amount of calories. It can be almost nothing. <clears throat> on average, it's probably around, I don't know, two or three calories. But I, I track it like a normal carbohydrate, and here's, here's why. Because you're not going to be able to get the whole breakdown of every single soluble fiber in there, and then you're not going to do the math of figuring it out and all that kind of stuff. Like, just count it like a normal carb. This whole net carbs thing is just a marketing ploy. Um, the idea that you can just, here, here's what I tell people. Hey, look. Um, if you think you can just not count fiber, go ahead and, that's like these, uh, yeah, if you think you can not count fiber, go ahead and do that and let me know if you don't gain weight, okay? Um, and then the other, the other part of that is like the, like, uh, Dave Asprey saying, well, you can cook rice in coconut oil and then it loses 70% of the calories. And people are asking me what I think about it. I go, um, okay, just try doing that and let me know how that works for you. Um, maybe, but I don't believe it. So, um, what I tell people is I don't pay attention to net carbs, um, because the idea was, well, net carbs are just the carbs that have an effect on your blood sugar, right? And soluble fiber doesn't affect your blood sugar because it's not absorbed as a carbohydrate. So, just because it's not absorbed as a carbohydrate doesn't mean that you don't get some of the calories because... The bacteria in your, um, in your intestine can ferment a lot of that soluble fiber to short-chain fatty acids, which short-chain fatty acids actually have a lot of metabolic benefits. I mean, I've done, I've done a piece on butyrate before. They appear to have benefits for the intestine, the liver, and probably overall metabolic health. Maybe even athletic performance as well. But mm -hmm. um, those short-chain fatty acids do have calories. Um, so you end up absorbing into the, you know, into the portal vein, something like, you know, 50 to 75% of those calories, uh, from a lot of soluble fiber sources. So again, I tell people, you can do whatever you want. If you want to track it as two calories, cool. But now you've got to make like another category of macronutrients. It just complicates things. Just track it like a carb and shut up. <laughs> yeah. It's really hard to break it down okay from the total carbs this portion is insoluble this this portion is soluble and out of this soluble this is resistant starch this is partially resistant <laughs> so it, it is just much easier to count it as a total carbs and you probably are overshooting a little bit over your calories in that case <coughs> but that is being more safer than undershooting the, cal the calories yeah Especially if you have a hard goal, like your contest prepping, there's something that you really need to be ready for in a couple of months versus someone that is just trying to improve their lifestyle. Maybe, again, is coming back to the basics. Maybe you don't need to worry so much about that at this point in time. You just need to be consistent. Just track your calories. Be consistent with your protein. Eat your fiber. Eat your vegetables and be active. And then you worry about the minors later. He's asking about sources of fiber. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes. and uh, yeah, some legumes and some cereals, seeds. like those sorts of things. And yeah. Like, seeds. And seeds? Yeah. Seeds. Yeah. yeah. 
So, um, yeah, like those are your sources of fiber. Not difficult. Now, if you want to take a supplement, that's fine too. Uh, I would say the whole food sources are going to be better. But if you have trouble getting your fiber in, then a, what I would say is, you know, something like Metamucil is probably better because it does have insoluble fiber as well. Um, you know, Benafiber, that is completely just soluble fiber, which is still good. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think something like Metamucil probably a little bit better. I agree. Well, Lane, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for spending some time with us and talking about all these different things that I wasn't even expecting to ask. <laughs> we kind of got yeah. into this part of talking about mental health and depression. And I think it is really important for us to just address these topics. Wait, oh, there, wait, there he is. My troll's here. He made it. He made it. I was wondering <laughs> where he is. Yes, this guy comes there he is. every single live. Every single live. But he's, hey, bro. You're fucking late today, man. You, you're late. You're supposed to be on here like the first two minutes. What happened? You were asleep? Pussy. God. Oh, man. Be, he's, man. Always, he's always on here within five minutes, and now he just got on here. I, I felt so personally offended that he was not on this live. So thank you for joining. All right, guys. Uh, Astrid, thanks for having me. Thanks for the questions. Hope you all have a great day, and I'll catch you all later. Have a good day. Bye-bye, Lane.